Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Arapahoe United Methodist Church here in Richardson, Texas. My name is Maggie Proshek, and I serve as one of the pastors here. This morning, we are starting a new worship series called Out, where we are going to be hearing the challenging words of Jesus that call us to so much more in our lives. And so we pray that this morning that it will be meaningful to you, that you will hear where God is speaking to you this morning. If you are new or you have been watching online for some time now, welcome. We are so glad that you have chosen to be with us in worship this morning or watching later on in the week. We're so glad that you are here. One of the best ways to be connected is by filling out our I'm New connection form that you can find on our website at arapahoumc.org slash new. It takes just a few minutes and it's just such an easy way to find ways that you can connect to the life of the church. And so we hope that you do that. We also have Zoom gatherings, coffee and connection with Pastor Scott. Our first one is th this coming up Sunday, next Sunday. And this is a great way for you to connect with Pastor Scott, to hear about who Arapahoe is and ways for you to be connected. And so if you are interested in signing up for that Zoom gathering, you can go to our website, find more information there and sign up. And so we hope that you will come and be a part of that time together. We have so many wonderful events and classes going on right now, and the best way to know about those things is by signing up for our newsletter that comes out every single week on Thursdays, and you can do that by going to our website, arapahoumc.org slash newsletter to sign up to receive that information. And so this morning, as we start this new worship series, as we are challenged by the words that Jesus has for us, May you take your candle in your homes and may you light it. And as you light this candle, may you be reminded of God's presence with you wherever you go. May, be, may you be reminded that you are a child of God, that you have been created for a purpose. And may you hear the ways that God is calling out to you in these times. Welcome to worship. up to the hills this my morning song where my strength comes from I lift my eyes up to the hills this my evening song where my help comes from this is the gravity of love just as the moon follows the sun, you're all around me. You're holding everything. This is the hope of every land. Just as the universe expands, your love is reaching. You're holding everything. our eyes up to the hills when will our help come lord we cry how long we lift our eyes up to the hills even as we run hope is chasing us this is the gravity of love just as the moon follows the sun you're all around me, you're holding everything. This is the hope of every land. Just as the universe expands, your love is reaching. You're holding everything. Oh, 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 oh. I see infinite stars, one for every human heart. And with all of these signs, 
I know I am not alone This is the gravity of love Just as the moon follows the sun You're all around me You're holding everything this is the hope of every land Just as the universe expands Your love is reaching You're holding everything This is the gravity of love Just as the moon follows the sun You're all around me You're holding everything This is the hope of every land Just as the universe expands your love is reaching, you're holding everything, oh, 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 We enter the time in our service now where we go to the Lord in prayer, where we, we ask for uh, forgiveness, where we, we challenge ourselves and we listen for God's word and the hope that God sends to us. Um, by having this conversation with him, we certainly bring in that hope into our hearts. And so I ask that you join with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we call upon you in Jesus' name. We come with empty hands. We have not been able to love our enemies. As a rule, we've never even seen them. We've avoided them. When we saw them, we only felt fear and anger, not love. So we come to you, not as the children of your love, but as the enemy of our enemies beseeching you for ourselves and all the others. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Forgive us for what we have failed to do for our enemies. God, our hearts lift up to you in praise and for your abundant grace which you shower on us. We are here hopeful. We are here to praise you and to understand and to commit once again, in the belief of your promise, that hope is always there, that hope is for us and for each, each living creature in your creation. God, you call out to us, and we cry out to you. We share specific joys today for Janine, whose car tire blew, but is safe from that accident. And for those who have new homes and a roof over their head, we are grateful for the opportunity that they have for that. We share concern and specific prayers for our family and friends, for those who are ill and those fighting COVID-19 all across our community, our state, our country, and the world. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for Brandon Dickens, son-in-law of Cliff and Suzanne Clark, whose surgery today after falling off a ladder was postponed so that they could uh, give him more uh, time for his leg to heal uh, properly after swelling. We pray for the unemployed and especially for Kevin who continues his search and for all those who are living through the effects of the downturn of the economy because of COVID-19 and the pandemic. We pray, God, for uh, peace in this world. We pray that we enter into that peace and that we continue that peace in what can always be a divisive time prior to our elections. God, we, we ask that you open our hearts, that we are uh, more open, that we are more loving, that we are more united as a body of Christ in love. You lead us out of constriction of fear, God, and out of the prison of hate into the wide space of freedom. Let us see your Son, God, 
which rises upon the evil and the good, and rejoice in its warmth together with our enemies. And as he taught us to pray, we come to you now with the words from Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. It reads, You have heard that it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give them their cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it has said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of the Father in heaven. For God makes God's sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and onto the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do you not even, do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Good morning, friends. My name is Scott Gilliland, and I'm the senior pastor here at Arapahoe United Methodist Church, and I'll welcome you to worship this morning. Uh, and if this is your first time joining us or you've been visiting online for a few weeks, I want to say a special word of welcome to you as well. And to let you know, if you want to learn more about who we are as a church and what we do, uh, you can do two things. One, you can go on our website to arapahoumc.org slash new, and you'll fill out a short 10-second form there uh, that'll sign you up for our weekly newsletter and also get you a personal contact from me and another pastor on our staff. You can also sign up for our coffee and community uh, morning next next Sunday at 9.15 a.m. on Zoom. I'll be hosting a coffee and community time where you can learn more about Arapahoe and what it means to be a member here um, and, and learn more uh, about what your life in this community could look like as I also get to hear your stories and what has brought you to this faith community. Today we are starting a new sermon series that we have titled Called Out. Uh, the, when Jesus, or Jesus' radical words for his would-be followers. And for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at selections of Scripture from the Gospel of Matthew, which I like to playfully call the Gospel for Good Churchy People, uh, because Matthew's Gospel is written for uh, those who are kind of religious insiders in the Jewish community. And, and it's helpful to come back and see that Jesus is calling us to something better than just a sort of a, a cultural version of our faith, uh, sort of a, 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 a over sentimentalized or, or, or low bar version of, of the walk of Jesus Christ. And in fact, the hardest words that Jesus has in the Gospel of Matthew are frequently directed not at some outsider, but actually at those who would claim to be his disciples. And Jesus is addressing this crowd who is seeking to follow after him in what we famously call the Sermon on the Mount. And he says this, you've heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. And so forgive me if you've already heard this, but um, this, this phrase, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, it was kind of an idiom, commonplace, uh, present in the Jewish tradition. We see it come up in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Uh, we also see it uh, present in other cultures and other faiths as well. This kind of uh, revenge style, it's, it's like the opposite of the golden rule. Instead of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, you do unto others exactly as they do to you, right? Um, and... and 
And yet we make the mistake sometimes of hearing Jesus address these kind of commonplace uh, thoughts uh, in his day, and, and we, we believe them to be indicative of the entirety of the Jewish faith as this sort of monolithic, single-voice kind of faith tradition. Now, we're Methodists, right? And, and we are under the umbrella of the Christian faith, but oh goodness, we would never want to be mistaken for Baptists or, or Bible churches or, or Catholics or, or Presbyterians or, or, or Mormons or things like that. And yet, you know, the Jewish tradition is just as rich and diverse, not just today, but in Jesus's day as well. In fact, there was a, a group called the Essenes at, in his time, and, and they sought a different approach to uh, this kind of problem in life, and they, they wanted to win over their enemies through love. Now, Jesus isn't going to suggest that in a moment, but the, the point being, there's more richness here. We shouldn't look at, at the Jewish people in Jesus' time as a caricature, where they were just this mean-spirited, exclusive, eye-for-an-eye, tooth-for-tooth kind of people. He's using this phrase more in the sense that it would have been common jargon and vernacular for his people at the time. Now, the next statement he says, but I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. And that could be really problematic for us. This is, you know, this is not a text where we need to just look at it literally and say, oh, Jesus said don't resist evil. Okay, I guess that makes sense. Because as, as Methodist people, when we are baptized, we, uh, we make a covenant and we promise to resist evil and oppression in every way in which they present themselves. So is the Methodist tradition anti-Jesus or unbiblical? No, I don't think that's what Jesus is getting at. Jesus is not advocating that we abandon our call to seek justice or to resist evil as the following examples that he shares with us will show. Let's not take this statement, do not resist, and misunderstand the remainder of this text. He's essentially saying, do not resist in this way. Don't resist in an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of way because that just feeds the cycle of revenge. And you know what this looks like in your life when you get sucked into the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, it's endless cycle. And eventually we all end up blind and toothless as a result. Jesus is saying, step out of that. Find a way to do this differently. What I heard in my life this week was when we want revenge, Jesus calls us to redefine resistance. When we want revenge, Jesus calls us to redefine resistance. Can resistance look different than simply seeking to, to strike back and strike hard and show no mercy, as Cobra Kai teaches us? Our guiding question then becomes this. I believe this is the guiding question that Jesus is asking us to consider. What truly breaks the cycle? What is it that we can do? when we feel wronged or when we experience inequity in this life, what is it that we can do to help break the cycle? And Jesus won't leave us hanging on this question. Uh, Jesus will, will sort of paint a picture for us of what that looks like. But these examples are important, and I want to walk through them for a moment. He says, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn your other cheek also. The right cheek would have been, it's like a backhand is the idea. If you stroke someone on their right cheek, the idea is you're backhanding them. It's this more insult than injury approach. He's saying turn your other, other cheek when you feel insulted. If anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, that's the main garment. The chiton is the word there. It's this main robe garment that they wore in these times. So you're being sued and pay, being taken for everything you have. He says don't just give them your coat. Give your cloak, your, your toga, your hematian as well. Give your toga. And so another example of not taking Jesus too literally because he just described someone stripping down and getting naked in a courtroom. I don't think that's what Jesus is really after here. Maybe there's some deeper meaning we should dig at. He says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go the second mile. Now, this is the hardest one for us to understand as people living 2,000 years later because his congregation in that day would have known exactly what he's talking about. He's referencing the systemic injustice that people who were occupied by the Roman Empire had to face. In those days, Roman soldiers or Roman officials or government officials were able to uh, go to an occupied civilian and basically forcibly enlist them to carry their equipment for any given distance, usually to the next town over, like a mile away. And Jesus says, why don't you take it two miles. Now, in, in these examples, we are positioned in the powerless place. We're the one being struck. We're the one being sued. We're the one being told to go to, to carry equipment an extra mile. But then Jesus shares two more examples. And notice the subtle but significant change that happens. He says, give to everyone who begs from you. Give to everyone who begs from you. 
and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. That power position gets flipped. Why? Why does Jesus do this? You know, I wonder. I sat with this and I wondered this week. Maybe Jesus places us in both positions of power, perhaps to see that power is complicated, especially when it comes to feeling wronged, that sometimes we can focus so intently on the ways in which we feel personally wronged that we too often forget the power that we do possess. And Jesus is not calling us to simply be passive, nice Christians. He's asking us to focus closely and, and see the differences, carve with the scalpel, see the nuance, and, and to notice that we're not off the hook when it comes to working for justice. Jesus isn't saying to check out and get passive and become doormats as Christians. Notice the person he's referring to every time in these examples is you. And the person whom it costs in every single example is you, is me. My friends, this is what I, I wrestled with this part a long time this week, and this is one thing I finally landed at. When our passive resistance, what Jesus is calling us to, when our passive resistance costs us something, when it costs me something personally, it's faithful. But when our passivity being nice and staying quiet, when our passivity costs the powerless, those who would beg or borrow from us, when it costs the powerless their dignity, my friends, that is dangerous. And I see this text getting misapplied so often to try to, try to encourage Christians to just be nice and stay quiet and get to the background. And that's not at all what Jesus is talking about. He's asking us to consider about how power works in this world. To consider when we can take the cost of breaking the cycle, to take that cost upon ourselves, but to not lose sight of the fact that sometimes we hold more power than we give ourselves credit for, and we must wield that power for justice and for equity for all. I'm getting worked up. I had a triple shot latte this morning. Bear with me. So Jesus keeps going. He says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And what's interesting there is, the Bible says frequently love your neighbor, but there's actually nowhere in the Old Testament that I can find where God commands us to hate our enemies. There's plenty of reflections on what it feels like to hate our enemies, or even times when we feel like maybe God is asking us to hate our enemies, but I can't find anywhere where God says you should hate your enemies. It isn't it interesting how we fill in the blank spaces for God sometimes, or we convince ourselves we've heard God's voice say something that maybe God's voice didn't say. But Jesus says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your God in heaven. For God makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. This concept of loving your enemy was not an abstract idea for Matthew's community. The Gospel of Matthew was written sometime around the year 72 A.D. or C.E. Um, it, it, came, it was written shortly after this really violent, catastrophic, and ultimately failed Jewish revolution in the years 66 to 70 that left the Jewish people greatly questioning who they are. They lost their temple in this failed coup. It was destroyed. Their identity was crushed. They didn't know who they were or where they were heading. And Matthew's gospel is in some ways trying to make the case the Jewish people should follow the risen Messiah. His name is Jesus. So this lesson means something to them. It's not something to just think about for them. This is something they've just experienced as they're hearing this gospel be preached and be written. And what does Jesus offer them? Not a path towards military success. Not a strategy for winning over the Roman Empire. Ultimately, Jesus offers them something different. The reason why we love our enemies is not to overtly win people over or to shame them or to lord our good righteousness over them. Jesus says that we are called to love our enemies because we want to emulate the heart and the love of a God who loves our enemies just as God loves us. 
A God who makes the sun rise and fall on our enemies just as it rises and falls on us. A God who makes it rain on the front yards of our enemies just as it rains on ours. A God who sent Christ down to die for those opposed to God, which includes you and me and, yes, our enemies. It's impossible to read this text and not picture the crucified Christ looking out upon a crowd, mocking him, a crowd that includes all of us, mocking him in his murder in Christ, asking God to forgive us. We love our enemies, my friends, and we engage in cycle-breaking new paths of resistance at our own expense because God does the same. That's the why. And here's where I don't have a clean and tidy answer for you. I'm left with two really big questions that honestly I'm still mulling over and wrestling with and allowing to stir within my soul as well. Here they are. What does my love look like for my enemies? And what do my prayers contain? Because words like love and pray are really big and really broad. And I wonder if Jesus uses big, broad words for a reason. Because maybe there doesn't need to be a simple, clean and tidy, easy answer here. Maybe we're supposed to be left holding these kinds of questions. What does my love look like for my enemies? And what do my prayers contain? I want to share a couple thoughts here as we wrestle with this this week, however. Again, this is not a love that asks us to step away from the paths of justice or accountability for those who abuse power. It's not loving. God, we misuse this word sometimes. It is not loving to allow someone to perpetuate a cycle of abuse or injustice. I'm going to say this again because it's going to help somebody. It is not loving to allow someone to perpetuate a cycle of abuse or injustice. And my friends, we don't have to adopt some sort of dishonest or syrupy sweet approach to love. I'm so sick and tired of syrupy sweet Christianity. Are you? I call it Bed Bath and Beyond Christianity. And I've got the wall hangings in my house too, but that is not all that Jesus is calling us to. We are not asked to adopt some dishonest, syrupy sweet version of love that only wishes all the best things in the world to, for, the peop, for the worst people in our lives. You don't have to lie to yourself to love your enemy. But we might also remember that life is complicated and that for somebody else, we're the enemy that Christ is calling them to pray for. My friends, ours is the difficult task to consider how God is leading us to love those whom we find hardest to see humanity in. I know who some of those people are in my life. Who are those people for you? And then on the subject of prayer. <laughs> prayer. Is there a broader word? Is there a broader request that Jesus could have made for us? Pray for those who persecute you. I don't think Jesus is asking us to offer sweet little prayers for those who would seek our own pain or suffering. But rather, in the moments when we'd like to turn to our visceral, instinctive, revenge-filled reactions, could we instead center ourselves through prayer? Center ourselves through a prayer that is honest, that is real, Sometimes my prayers are rejoicing, sure, but many times my prayers are questions and frustrations and even rage or just plain silence because I don't even know what to say. Don't ever let someone tell you exactly what you're supposed to pray. Bring your realness, bring your honesty to God and then see what happens. Could we center ourselves through prayer with a chain-breaking God whom could guide us to the next right step and also offer perspective that we might not otherwise gain? And so what's the end result of this work? Because this is work. The end result, Jesus says, is that we are made perfect as God is perfect. And that's, who perfect. That's a dangerous word, especially if you're a perfectionist like me. That's its own kind of broken cycle, isn't it? But the word that Jesus uses here, and we see translated as perfect, really means to be made one. To be made whole. That when we do this work, when we enter into this kind of prayer, when we seek this kind of love, when we allow the Holy Spirit to work on us in this, in this kind of way, when we choose the path of resistance without choosing revenge, when we take the cost upon ourselves and don't forget our own power to help those who are in systems of injustice, when we love our enemies in the ways in which God leads us to, and when we draw near to God through a prayer that seeks to heal, not only will our world be made whole, but I trust that we will as well. Amen.
click delete Stand face to face with the younger me All of the mistakes, all of the heartbreak Here's what I do differently I love like I'm not scared Give when it's not fair Live life for another Take time for a brother Fight for the weak ones Speak out for freedom Find faith in the battle Stand tall but above it all Fix my eyes on you Oh, 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 on you I learn the lines and I talk the talk But the road less traveled is hard to walk It takes a soldier who knows his orders To walk the walk I'm supposed to walk And love like I'm not scared Give when it's not fair Live life for another Take time for a brother Fight for the weak ones, speak out for freedom, find faith in the battle, stand tall but above it all. Fix my eyes on you, oh oh, oh oh, oh oh, on you. The things of earth are dimming In the light of your glory and grace I'll set my sights upon heaven I'm fixing my eyes on you Oh, 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 oh I'm fixing my eyes on you Oh, oh uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, I'm fixing my eyes. Love like I'm not scared, give when it's not fair. Live life for another, take time for a brother. Fight for the weak one, speak out for freedom. Find faith in the battle, stand tall but above it all. Fix my eyes on you, oh, 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 on you, oh, 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 on you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Eliana Rios, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Arapaho UMC. And today I'm bringing to you two ways that you can volunteer um, for this month, the month of October. So if you don't know, AUMC has a pumpkin patch that we do every year, and we're so happy that it is back. We're so happy that we get to do this, uh, even during COVID, in a safe way. And if you would like to volunteer, there is still time, and you are still able to do that. There are shifts daily that you can sign up for, um, and if you need to know um, the website to sign up for, the Sign Up Genius will be www.arapahoumc.org slash connect. And we want you to know that all of the proceeds from the pumpkins that we sail during this pumpkin patch will support the Missions Fund and also the Navajo Farms in New Mexico. The second way to volunteer um, is through Austin Street Center. And several times each year, uh, we collect items uh, to prep food, serve food um, at the shelter in Dallas. And if, uh, for those of you that are tuning in um, and want to know a little bit more about Austin Street, Austin Street is um, one of the best in the country at serving the needs of our uh, homeless community and those that are in transition. Um, so to volunteer for that on October 24th and 25th, you can serve in several ways. You can serve and volunteer by donating, um, buying and donating paper plates of any kind 
Um, the staff is requesting plates as they're catering more meals during COVID. Um, and you can leave those plate donations by the east doors. And if you are unable to go and purchase the plates, you can always donate at www.arapahoumc.org slash donate. The second way that you can help with Austin Street is by being a food prepper. Uh, we have instructions on what food you will need to prepare. And the third way to help with Austin Street will be to help go and deliver and serve food early on Sunday morning. Um, Cliff Clark and his team do such an amazing job at keeping this effort organized. And if you want to help again and um, go ahead and email either Pastor Kathy, Pastor Maggie, Pastor Scott, or myself, or go again to the www.arapahoumc slash connect. So come near the close of our service this morning, I want to call our attention to a couple of things. One is uh, I and several of the staff had the opportunity to go uh, help out with Network of Community Ministries this past week and uh, take some school supplies to be used uh, for RISD and load them into trucks and take them out of trucks. And uh, it was, A, just really good to get out and stretch your legs in some fresh air in this beautiful weather. And B, it made me so thankful for the ways in which, not just here at Arapahoe, but throughout this uh, greater Richardson area, the ways in which we've adapted to meet the needs of this time and the ways that we volunteer, as Pastor Eliana was just naming, and, and the ways in which we're trying to reach out beyond ourselves and, and to and be there for our community in this new and difficult season. Um, and, and then secondly, I was you know, really proud of us. I, I got to uh, lead a class on Tuesday evening this past week that's called Ask Me Anything. And um, we talked about the, the problem of evil. And um, one of the comments that was made from uh, a couple of people who are newer to our church, who actually only ever attended online in the way that you are right now, um, they said, you know, I didn't know that church could be like this. I didn't know I could bring these kinds of questions, that we could have these kinds of conversations at church. This is so refreshing to see. It makes me proud to be the pastor at a church like Arapahoe that is constantly looking for ways to meet new needs in new ways, that wants to be that kind of a place where people can bring their real selves, bring their honest prayers, bring their real questions and their real doubts, and to come together and try to be community together. That, that's the kind of place that I want to be. I don't know about you. And that's one of the reasons why I am happy to support the ministries here at Arapahoe, and I want to thank you for your support that allows us to do these kinds of things, to meet the needs of our community and our neighbors in new and exciting ways, and to also be the kind of hospitable place where people can bring their full selves to the table. And so uh, thank you for your generosity, and, and for those who are not yet supporting us financially, I want to invite you to do that, because I do believe that what happens here, whether that's online, within these walls, outside our campus, or the ministries that are conducted around the world, because of your generosity. They matter. And so there are three easy ways to give. The first is you can go online to arapahoumc.org slash donate. And there you'll find a couple of different ways that you can uh, sign up for either a one-time gift or a recurring gift, which we're especially grateful for. You can also give by texting the, the word give to the number 972 972- 483-2862, 972-483-2862. And lastly, you can always mail in a check uh, to our church here at 1400 West Arapahoe Road, Richardson, Texas, 75080. I want to thank you for your continued generosity and thank you for being with us in worship this morning. And now, as we go, I offer you these parting words of peace. May we go from God's church into God's world as a people wrestling with the challenging words of Jesus who calls us to a passive resistance that costs us something, who calls us to love our enemies even when we're not sure what that looks like, and who calls us to pray, to bring our real selves before God, to meet God in those moments, to allow our hearts and our minds to be graced by God's presence. Go in peace. Amen.